And listen as our choir sings, Nothing shall separate me from the blood of the Lamb. Take our hymnals once again, please. Page 368, stand, and let's sing He Lives. Page number 368, please stand with us. I serve the risen Savior, He's in the world today. I know that He is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer, and just the time I need him, he's always here. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to He lives, 
as the instruments play through that a time or two, get around, shake hands with your neighbor. Sing that second. <laughs> children's choir uh, directed by Miss Carl Mitchell.
Those guys are really good. Amen? All right. Well, welcome to the Resurrection Sunday services here at Pioneer Baptist. Good to see each of you. There couldn't possibly be a better looking group of men and women in all of Los Angeles County. Amen, Larry? All right. We've got some first-time visitors here uh, with Nina, is her good friend Ann, and that's her hairdresser. So I was really glad to meet her because she's the only one that knows what color Nina's hair really is. <laughs> so you just talk to her after, after church and she'll tell you. And then over to the other, to the left a little farther, Norma and Dave, who are bowling buddies, they, their uh, name of the team is the Chili Peppers. So with Nina, that's a red hot chili papers. <laughs> and I've got a question for Norman Dave too. Is Nina really as good as she says she is? Yeah, she is. All right, good. She never, she never brags. All right. Anybody else here for the first time? Yes. Albert, great to have you with us. Thank you for being here. All righty, let me make some announcements. And you know what? I didn't even grab that track. Who's got one of the, the tracks in the feature track? I thought I grabbed it. Not the, I got the program. The track. Steve, will you grab one of those tracks on display, the feature track today? We've got uh, Jack Wyman next Sunday morning and Sunday night and Sunday school will be preaching. You're going to enjoy that very much. An uh, old friend of mine from the great state of Maine, he's from Texas now. And uh pastor said that that's where the Lord's going to return to Dallas, Texas. He checked that all out. That was in Sunday school. If you weren't here, you missed it. How should I know? Did it say it was a featured track? All right. Well, you're an intelligent man. You should know that. Thank you very much. All righty. The darts will be here, so don't miss that on the 30th. So Jack Wyman on next Sunday. Then next Wednesday, a week from this Wednesday, the darts will be here for a concert. You'll enjoy that. And May 3rd, track distribution, 16th and the 17th, the Master's Men. That's a conference up there in Fresno, I believe. I was there last year, just didn't know where I was. Early registration cost is $45, and please pay by Sunday, May 4th. And uh, then May 31st, we have a work day, birthdays. Beth, is Beth here? Not yet, she will be. I think we should sing happy birthday to her anyway. And Evelyn Bartell, they were both born, they were born one day apart, Beth and Evelyn. So, Evelyn, happy birthday to you. And then we've got an anniversary, Bill and Yvonne de Makaroff on the 22nd. So, Brother Mike, can we do this? All righty. Any other birthdays or, yes? Her birthday. All right. All right. So we'll add, add Renee to the list. Good. All right. Well, let's Anybody do, else? Let's do happy anniversary first. All right. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary. God bless you. Happy anniversary. Happy birthday to these. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Now, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Christian, to your extreme left, is that a first time visitor with you? Who's? Yes, I need somebody to interpret it because my. Would you repeat that again for me? Oh, Nina, yes. Any relation? Uh, just. Your yeah, auntie. All right. Well, good. It's good to have you with us today. Thank you for coming. All right, and appropriately, here's the track. He lives. Nice colored track, and the door to the tomb is open. And we've heard it uh, plenty of times before, but if you're a Muslim, you can go visit, uh, I guess, Mohammed's tomb if you want to. 
And uh, about whatever you are, you know, if you happen to be a Christian science person, Mary Baker Eddy must be buried somewhere, or at least we imagine she was. And uh, they, what do they say about Christian science? It's like grape nuts, not grape and not nuts. And Christian science isn't Christian, it isn't scientific. But anyway, you go to the, if you found the tomb of Jesus, it would be empty. Now, I don't know when you go on those trips over there, Brother Mike, how many different ones they got or how much they charge you to see them. Gordon's tomb, is it? The, two of them. So uh, anyway, they're empty. Amen? And praise the Lord for it. He's not here for his risen, as he said. Great track. Grab it. Hand it out. And let's see if somebody can get saved. Amen? I hope somebody says amen before this service is over besides me. Gentlemen, will you come? We'll take the Sunday morning offering. And all the deacons said, amen. amen. All righty, I'm trying to find out if anybody came to the 6 o'clock service and then skipped out. And if they did, I'm gonna have, we're going to uh, gonna have to start taking an offering at the uh, sunrise service. So those guys don't get away free. Just because they got out of bed at 5 o'clock is no excuse. Isn't that right, Troy? All right. Well, it's good to see you. There's Georgie boy over there. Hi, George. A couple of kids with him. and Man, that's good. Good, good, good. Everybody doing all right? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. What a great day to be in church here as we celebrate the resurrection. God, thank you for the great music we heard from our young people. Very talented. And God, would you bless them and watch over them. And as they grow up, might they never depart from the faith that they've learned here as young people. God, thank you for our guests and visitors. Bless those especially that are having birthdays and anniversaries, we pray. And Father, as we open our Bibles here in a minute and talk about the Lord Jesus Christ, would you bless? Oh, we're so thankful for each person that's come out. Give us a great day and bless this offering, we pray. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, ladies. Take your hymnals one last time, please. Uh, page 79. Stand with us. My Jesus, I love thee. Page 79.
Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Soldiers tried to clear the narrow street, but the crowd pressed in to see a man condemned to die on Calvary. He was bleeding from a beating, there were stripes on his back. And he wore a crown of thorns upon his head And he bore with every step The scorn of those who cried out for his death Down the Via Dolorosa Called the way of suffering Like a lamb came the Messiah Christ the King But he chose to walk that road Out of his love for you and me Down the weird old Rosa All the way to Calvary Down the Rosa in Jerusalem that day, the soldiers tried to clear the narrow street, but the crowd pressed in to see the man condemned to die on Calvary. Down the Via Dolorosa Called the way of suffering Like a lamb came the Messiah Christ the King But he chose to walk that road Out of his love for you and me Down the Via Dolorosa Calvary, the blood that would cleanse the souls of all men, made its way through the heart of Jerusalem. Down the Via Dolorosa, on the way of suffering. Like a lamb came the Messiah, Christ the King. But he chose to walk that road out of his love for you and me. Down the Via Dolorosa, all the way to Calvary.
Among notables that I did not mention, Trisha Siedemach is down here with uh, her daughter Dahlia, and for the holidays, and good to see you, Trish, and Gloria's here on her yearly trip from New York. She's the only person from New York that I'll talk to. <laughs> she wishes she was from Boston. I happen to know that. <clears throat> well, today, <clears throat> we look at uh, Mark chapter 16, verse 1. Mark chapter 16, verse 1. There's something special about today. We do, we celebrate the resurrection really, every Sunday and every day of our lives. And 1 Corinthians, all kinds of places, talk about the resurrection and how important it is to us. And we've, we've discussed those things and preached on them uh, lots of times, no doubt. But it's the resurrection. Because he lives, we live. Amen? Amen. Victory over hell, death, and the grave. The resurrection is the key to Christianity. And in chapter 16, on the first day of the week, it says when the Sabbath was passed, uh, they came early in the morning. So we'll begin reading in chapter 16, verse 1. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene Mary and Mary, the mother of James, that was, they think, James the last, according to Mark 15, 40, whoever that was. And some of these names, you get, oh, several Marys in the scripture, and a lot of James, and you can, you can do a lot of uh, studying about it and arguing about it in your coffee shop theology, but uh, this is Mary, J uh, mother of James the Less, if you will, and Salome, who's the wife of Zebedee and the mother of James Zebedee. They had brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came under the sepulchre at the rising of the sun. And by the way, Jesus wasn't there. Amen? He had already risen. And they said among themselves, Who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulchre? The stone would have been very, very heavy. And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulchre, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrighted. And he saith unto them, Be not affrighted, you see Jesus of Nazareth. Now comparing Scripture with Scripture becomes really obvious this was an angel. And by the way... Uh, if you see a female angel, beware. All the angels mentioned in the Bible are men. So if you see some good-looking female angel come into your room at night, uh, get him out of there. Satan probably sent him. He's risen. He's not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go your way. Tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you, shall you see him as he said unto you. Father, we ask now, God, again, as we look to this scripture, the Bible that you wrote, that, God, you would speak to our hearts and thrill us, inspire us, challenge us, educate us, convict us, all of those things. And, God, thank you for that resurrected Christ. And, oh, God, if there might be someone here today that hasn't put their trust in the risen Christ, might this be the day that they do so? And, God, no that to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ is to have eternal security, knowing you're going to heaven when you leave this life. God, thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. These three ladies, and maybe more, who came to anoint the body of the Lord, were also there at the crucifixion. Now, I don't know how many scriptures we'll turn to, but you can turn one page in your Bible, probably, and read verses 39 and 40. And when the centurion which stood over against him saw that he so cried out and gave up the ghost, meaning he was dead, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. There were also women looking on afar off, among whom was Mary Magdalene and mother, Mary the mother of James, the lesson of Joses and Salome. These ladies were there at the crucifixion. And then they were there, at the, uh, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James, the less, were also there at the burial as well. Again, we can look to chapter 15, verse 42, where the Bible, Bible says, And now when the evening was come, because it was a preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, there was a special Sabbath going on, 
Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor, which also waited for the kingdom of God, came and went in boldly unto Pilate and craved the body of Jesus. And Pilate marveled if he were already dead. And calling unto him the centurion, he asked him whether he had been any while dead. And when he knew it of the centurion, he gave the body to Joseph. And he brought, bought fine linen and took him down and wrapped him in the linen and laid him in a sepulcher which was hewn out of a rock and rolled a stone unto the door of the sepulcher. And Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph beheld where he was laid. So these are ladies. They were there at the crucifixion. They were there to see where he was buried. And then when the Sabbath was passed, early on the morning of the first day of the week, they came to the tomb to anoint the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, Nicodemus was in the mix too. If we look over to John 19, verses 38 through 42, he was there along with Joseph of Arimathea. So when we look at Nicodemus, that great <coughs> ruler of the Jews that came with questions by night to Jesus, and we wonder whatever happened to him when Jesus said, Art thou a master of Israel, knoweth not these things? And told him about the new birth and all of that stuff. Good stuff that he communicated to Nicodemus. And Nicodemus was there with Joseph of Arimathea helping with the burial. Good chance Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, got saved. Well, he was in the mix too. So people were there. People knew about it. And as the Bible said, Paul said before Agrippa, this thing was not done in a corner. People knew about it. The point being that Jesus was crucified, that he died on the cross, and there was no doubt about it. The centurion told Pilate that he was dead. Now these are soldiers. They major in killing. And the Roman army was a tough army. Well trained, well drilled. And this guy, he's a professional soldier. And when he says the guy's dead, he probably knows what he's talking about. The, he had seen the blood drop out. They knew a dead man when they saw one. And Jesus was dead. He died on the cross. Our three ladies watched it happen. They were witnesses. And then they followed the folks to the sepulcher. After Joseph of Arimathea had gained permission from Pilate to take possession of the body. And you see... If we look at the gospel in a nutshell, over in, we don't need to turn over there, but over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we, I call it the gospel in a nutshell, briefly, says that the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried. All of this according to the scriptures. And it was a hasty thing at the time because it was a high day coming. And the Jews needed to get him down quickly and buried for religious reasons, if you will. Bible says in John 19, the Jews, therefore, because it was a preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was a high day, it wasn't Sunday, it was a Sabbath day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So here come the soldiers, they break the two legs of the thieves, the legs of the, the two thieves, they don't need to break Jesus' legs. And Scripture said there wouldn't be a bone of him broken. Scripture was fulfilled. They saw that he was dead already. They took him down. One of the soldiers ran a spear into his side. Blood and water came out. He was dead. Well, and it's Passover season. So it's a high day. It's a preparation day. And they get him down and get him into the tomb. But after three days, the ladies were able to return to anoint the body. They knew he had died. They knew it was a proper action they were taking. They came prepared. Now, you'd have to get prepared for something like this, wouldn't you? They love Jesus. And they're going to anoint the body. Uh, I'd say they had to get ready mentally and physically. And no doubt, they had done their best to emotionally pump themselves up for what would be an overwhelming emotional task at the very least, for a lot of reasons. So here they come. But they've got a concern. It's a very heavy stone that needs to be rolled away. How would these two members of the Pharisees possibly accomplish this? But then, 
It must have been a tremendous shock to find that the stone was already rolled away. Now, who's trying to break into a tomb? And the Roman seal is there, by the way. They had come, the Jews had come and complained and said, look, you know, let's make sure his disciples don't come and steal the body away. So this, you know, little legend continues and the, you know, the last arrow will be worse than the first and everything. And Pilate said, you've got, you've got a, you've got a set of guards here. You've got to watch. Go and make it as sure as you can. They sealed the tomb. They sealed the tomb. Now, who is going to come and mess around with a couple of Roman soldiers that represent the Roman government? You know, they said, I've heard it, I couldn't vouch for this, that uh, people on the foreign field on occasionally would get chased by uh, nationals and uh, be under threat of death. They grabbed the American flag and wrapped themselves up in it and people didn't dare to come after them. Now, that would have been a long time ago. But let me tell you this. If you offended the Roman government, they would not be worried about any rules of engagement. They would come in and wipe the place out. There is no UN, and there shouldn't be, but, <laughs> but there was no UN, and when somebody offended you, Sergeant, you came in, and you brought retribution and wreaked havoc. The Romans were not messing around, and nobody's messing with the Romans. And yet, that stone was rolled away. Hmm. Who would dare to do such a thing? Well, they find the stone rolled away. And they enter the tomb. And guess what? There's no body in there. But rather two angels in shining clothing who then ask the ladies, why seek you the living among, among the dead? Hey, what are you doing here looking for Jesus? You're looking for a dead man? You came to the wrong place. And they continued. He's not here, but is risen, as he said. He told everybody that would listen he was going to rise from the dead. But I guess that's a tough thing to grasp. Well, the apostles, who were somehow shocked to hear that what Jesus told them would happen, did happen. And Peter and John then run to the sepulchre to see, and shortly after, Mary Magdalene sees Jesus in the garden and talks with him. All of this now, try to put yourself in that place. You went down there to anoint a body. Instead, you say, how are we going to get this stone rolled away? Instead, the stone's rolled away. You look in, the tomb is empty. There's a couple of angels in there, and they say, hey, he's not here, he's risen. Just like he told you. And then later, Mary Magdalene is talking to him. And he said, look, you go tell him I'm going to go to Galilee, just like I said, and I wanted them to come up there. Wow, what a shock. And Peter and John run over and find out that, yes, the tomb is empty. Suddenly, and in one sense, without warning. Now, had they listened to Jesus carefully, they would have expected it. But everybody, everybody was shocked. Why? I would submit to you because the contrast was so dramatic. I've been to a lot of funerals. I mean, I've been around this stuff. We all have. It's part of life. Amen? But to go to the funeral of a loved one and look in the casket and find it empty, and an angel steps out beside it and says, by the way, what are you looking in that casket for? He's not dead, he's alive. What are you going to think? If you watched him die, maybe you saw the body two days ahead. You came in for the funeral three days later. And boom, everything has changed. And then you think it's a mortician and it says, uh, by the way, Mary, tell the disciples I'll be uh, meeting them in Galilee. You don't think that would be shocking to you? What a contrast between life and death. It's dead versus alive. When you know, knew someone was dead and is now alive, that's a dramatic contrast. It's striking. It's an emotional impact. It's overwhelming. It's mind boggling, And it's upside down in an unbelievably right-side-up fashion, if you will. It's everything turned right that you think was wrong. And you knew it was wrong. It's too good to be true, and yet it is true. It's more than you could expect, even when you had been told to expect it. 
It's the impossibly becoming more than possible, in fact, guaranteed. It's the implausible becoming more than plausible and certified and translatable to every believer. Why? Because Christ is the first fruits of our resurrection. Because he lives, we'll live. He proved it. He's the first fruits. That means there's more fruit to come. And that more fruit to come is us. Christ is not only his resurrection, he's ours. And guess what? That dead versus alive thing is one of the things that Christianity is. Now I'm going to call it this. It's a convergence of contrast, all for the good. It's a convergence of contrast, all for the good. Two things that are really diametrically opposed, life and death, coming together and meeting, and it's all for the good. And that's one of the things that Christianity is. It's an amazing contrast, but it's not the only one. That's one. But there's a contrast in our actual being as Christians. We know the verse, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. What a shocking contrast that is between what we were and what we are now. Once you get saved, your habits have changed. We say your want to's changed. They say, oh, you're Baptist, you can sin all you want to. Well, listen, I sin more than I want to, amen? I want to have changed. Why? Because when we're in Christ, then Christ is in us. And it's a change from the inside out. It's not some discipline that we've adopted. It's not some courses that we've taken. It's the fact that Christ has given us a brand new nature. He's changed our appetites, you might say. You say, what are you, a vegetarian? No, I'm a Christitarian. <laughs> Amen? And what we want now on our plate is the Bible. And we want our plates full. It's a change from the inside out because of the new birth in Christ. The resurrected Christ. And that's a shocking contrast. So yeah, what happened to Mitchell? Well, he went and got religion. He's gone off the deep end. He really changed. You guys have heard that, haven't you? And you say, well, I got changed as a little boy. Well, Ben Mitchell gave a testimony today at the morning service. Got saved at a pretty young age, I think around four. And he said, he had a burden, my words, not his, about sin. And when he got saved, he was just overwhelmed and brokenhearted to know that he had been redeemed. Amen? So that's not an old man, that's a young kid. But that sins on all of us. It's a shocking can contrast. We might say, thanks to Calvary, we don't go there anymore. Over in Colossians, it talks about our having put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is received in knowledge, renewed in knowledge, after the image of him that created him. All of that has taken place. It's a great convergence of contrast, if you will, for the good. When I got a new nature, we're not what we once were. We're sinners by nature, we're born into it, and we're sinners by practice. And when God gives you that new nature, he looks at you as a new, a new creation in Christ. You're a child of God. It's not the same. You say, how can that happen? It's a convergence of contrast for good. All thanks to the resurrection that we are celebrating today. Not only that, there's a release from bondage. You talk about a life sentence. I read the paper now and then. So one guy got 113 years or something the other day in Long Beach for, you know, all kinds of bad stuff that he was doing. You talk about a life sentence and then receiving a presidential pardon. Can you imagine that? Imagine it. You're in jail for life. Done for. That's where you're going to be. And then somebody comes down and says, hey, you've been pardoned. Imagine that. Bible says over in Hebrews, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetimes subject to bondage. We know the Bible says it's appointed on a man once to die. We know that's out there, amen? And that lost man, why lost parents will tell their kids, just don't think about it. Try not to worry about it. 
But people do worry about it, don't they? I mean, it's a sad thing when you see somebody about to be executed and they're begging for their life. Because that's all they've got. So that lost man, he's all his lifetime subject to bondage. That's a life sentence. Doomed to a bondage of fear. Now you want to talk about a contrast. You want to talk about Paul writing to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You want to talk about him actually having a desire. A desire, he said, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. What? Everybody's holding on to life for all they're worth. And Paul's saying, well, I'm ready to go. Why? Because I know to be gone from here is to be present with the Lord. Amen. Jesus said, in my father's house are many mansions. Amen. Amen. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. Every one of you that's saved. Now think about that. We're down here struggling to pay the taxes and the mortgage. Amen? Amen. Up there, it's all taken care of. Amen? Amen? You want that 40 acres? You got it. I guess. I really don't know. But I know it's a mansion. Because that's what Jesus said. As a matter of fact, he said this. If it were not so, I would have told you. Right. Amen? So there we go. We've got a desire. Yeah, talk about a, if you're a Monopoly player, get out of jail free card. What a contrast. What a convergence of contrast to the good. We see this coming in. Death and life. Boom. The old man and the new man. Boom. We look at this. I'm, I'm under bondage. Now, hey, guess what? I'm not worried about it anymore. Right? Boy, and that's not all. In First Thessalonians, Paul wrote and he said, For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. It's not just a re reformation. You know, hey, we're trying to give up drinking, you know, trying to reform myself and trying to get on the right track. It's not that. It's so much more than that. Repentance is a turning from one thing to another. See, these guys, they turned from idols, and then they didn't just throw the idols out and say, all right, now I'm going to live my life as a humanist. They turned from idols, why? To serve the living God. What a contrast that is. Imagine that. Bible talks about in Ephesians, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. You say, well, hey, listen, I would never bad in the flesh. What about your mind? What about that? See, we're alienated from God if we're not saved. Our mind is not right with God. You can't be good enough to please God. Unless you're perfect, and nobody's been perfect other than the Lord. I know right now there's not a person here that would stand up and say, Pastor, I've never done anything wrong. I've never thought a bad thought. I know there's not a person here that would do that. The lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we're by nature the children of wrath, even as others. The Apostle Peter wrote and said, For the time past of our life may suffice us, suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles, when we will walk in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings. He said, I haven't done any of those, Pastor. What about banquetings? That's the next thing he mentioned. How many Christians have been guilty of the sin of banqueting? I'm first in line. I'm the biggest glutton there is. God came into Dr. Boyle's church and... and uh, in Portland, Maine. And Dr. Boyle went from being a real big guy to a real small guy and then back to being a real big guy again and back to a smaller guy again. But his principal was a real big guy and the music director, Brother Case, was a big guy and all of that. The guy came in and said, hey, what's going on here? What about the sin of banqueting? Look, there's some sin in there that's going to catch you. Life Action Singers came in way back in the old days. And uh, they sang at Bangor Baptist. And they handed out a sin sheet. You know, eight and a half by 11, all the sins that you could name listed on there. And they said, just check off the ones you're guilty of. Well, listen, man, I've been around long enough to know I'm not going to admit my sins to somebody. You know what I mean? 
So some people were checking off a few, and I don't, you know, we weren't looking at each other's sheets and all that, but they had a point. So Buddy Franklin, he was a pastor, he got up, he said, I took one look at that sheet, and I marked next down through all of them. I'm guilty of all of them. Look, that's who we are. And there's a convergence of contrast that comes when God gets a hold of your heart. And you say, thank the Lord for the resurrected Christ. Thank the Lord for the new birth. And he turns you, just like he rolled the stone away. He turns you. You can't do it by yourself. God's got to work a work in you. And he gets a hold of your wretched heart. Jeremiah said, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? He turns that, he gives you a new heart and turns you to Christ. It doesn't mean you're not, it doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. But you've got a new nature. The Christian can't be happy going down and getting drunk and cheating on his wife anymore. He's got to fight off the Holy Spirit that is in him, that is telling him, hey, buster, knock it off. And when you sin against the grace of God, you better wait and hope he doesn't jerk your chain real hard. Amen? You say, oh, you're preaching fear. That's my next point. The next contrast. The next conversion of, of contrast. Revelation 20:15 says, Whosoever is not far written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Oh, no, preacher, you're not one of those guys. Yes, I am. I have my Ph.D., I'm a preacher of hellfire and damnation. <laughs> Contrast a burning hell with a beautiful new Jerusalem. Amen? Coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Streets of gold. No tears. No lies. No murders. The literal pearly gates. You mean there really are pearly gates? The literal pearly gates. Several kinds of pearls that they're adorned with. Perfect happiness in the Father's house. Imagine the contrast. You want to talk about a convergence of contrast for the good? Wow. You talk about a lake of fire versus a beautiful heaven. Now just imagine that. You see, one way to describe Christianity is by the convergence of contrast for the good. And we as believers are the recipients of the good, of every one of those shocking contrasts that I've mentioned. Life versus death. Serving Christ versus serving the world. Heaven versus hell. All of that, we're the recipients of it. Now there are five contrasts of the Christian faith this morning, but who knows how many more could be listed. You probably say, well, preacher, you left out this one, you left out that one. Sure, we could go on for a long time with it. The signature of what is often termed Easter, really the resurrection, is a dramatic contrast for the good. Those contrasts that are brought to every born-again believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, my challenge today is this. Don't get stuck on the wrong side of the contrast. Don't get stuck in an eternal death versus eternal life. Don't get stuck serving idols instead of God. Don't get stuck on that stuff. Christians today are rejoicing in those contrasts. But this morning, as we speak, there is a rich man in hell burning forever, bewailing the fact that he died on the wrong side of those contrasts. When the ladies got over the shock of it all, the empty tomb was the greatest thing ever. Now, right off the bat, you're trying to get your bearings. What's happening? What's going on? Angels, oh man, what's happening? When they got over the shock of that, it was the greatest thing that could ever happen. The tomb is empty. He's risen. It's the greatest thing. Hey, the Lord's risen, man. He's alive. I talked to him. He's going to Galilee. We're back in business. Praise the Lord. They thought the Jews had won. They thought the Romans had won. He's dead. What do we do now? All of that, and boom, he's risen. When they got over the shock of it, it was the greatest thing ever. But to Pilate and the religious leaders who were on the wrong side of the contrast, it was a frightening day. But they still had a chance. They had a chance to believe in and receive the Lord Jesus Christ. Pilate had that chance. 
They all have that chance. It's the same chance that all of us have today. Anybody that might be here without Christ, your mother, your aunt, your uncle, your son, your daughter, your grandfather, we've all got that chance. If you've never received Christ as Lord and Savior, imagine the contrast. Amen? Imagine the contrast. He says, well, hey, I think I'm okay. I'll take my chances. Without Christ, you don't have a chance. Without Christ, you don't have a chance. You know, I don't want to gamble on a couple of bucks at Vegas. I'm sure not going to gamble my life. When I pick up this Holy Bible, and it tells me to put my trust in Jesus Christ, and I see the contrast between, hey, you know, and you see people who say, boy, that guy's a pretty, pretty good guy. And then you find out he's a Christian. And then you see somebody else that, man, they have no faith whatsoever. They're not part of the Christian faith, and they're robbing stores, and they're cheating on their wife, and they're beating around, and they're doing all that stuff. What a contrast. Contrast the church and the world. Well, the church, I know people at church, bunch of hypocrites. Okay, stop that right now. Church members aren't perfect. But let me tell you something. The finest people in the world are in church pews. I'll tell you that right now. The contrast. Now is your chance to get on the right side of the contrast. Don't miss the chance. Don't miss the chance. You're alive, you're breathing. Lord Jesus Christ died for your sins. He wants you to come to Christ. And listen, maybe everybody here is saved. Maybe everybody here is on the way to heaven. Say, preacher, I got no problem. I got saved 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Praise the Lord for it. But I'll tell you what else. How about on Resurrection Sunday, we look at these contrasts and see where we could have been compared to where we are and say, thank God for what he's done in my life. Because, as I've told you people, I'm a free will Calvinist these days. But I'll tell you what, if God didn't get a hold of your wretched soul, every one of you guys would be in hell today. Every one of you. Every last one of you. It's, well, I made a big decision and I turned my life around. No, you didn't. No, you did not. You came to a point where the Holy Ghost convicted your wretched heart and that you needed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and you submitted, you gave up and said, yes, I need Jesus Christ to save me. And boom, boom, he worked a work in your heart. He created you a new creature. And you can get away from him. You can go bad for a while, but God ain't going to let you get away with it. And God gets a glory. And maybe you say, well, preacher, I don't need to be saved. But you know what? I need to take a trip to that altar and just say, thank you, Jesus, for the resurrection. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's the message of Resurrection Sunday right there. And it's a stark contrast between the world and the bride of Christ. Amen? Shall we pray? Father, thank you for loving us and dying for us on that cross. Thank you, God, for this Resurrection Sunday. And all that it means, and oh, it means so much. God, thank you for it. I thank you I'm not headed for a devil's hell. I thank you I know enough to read my Bible by the grace of God. I thank you I know enough by the grace of God to pray. I thank you that by the grace of God, I'm a new creature. My wants have been changed. I'm now a Christetarian. That's my diet. And God, I thank you for it. I pray as we have an invitation today. Oh God, if there's anyone here today that aren't saved, that they might come. And let us show them that they can walk out of here today, a new creature in Christ. It doesn't take long. We just got to ask you into our hearts. And you promised, him that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. It's simple for us. It was hard for him. But God, might they come. Christians ought to lead the way. We ought to hit these altars and say, oh, thank you for the resurrection. God bless to that end, we pray as we have a short invitation. And we ask it all. In the name of our living Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.